So the implicit method of the joint declaration on the doctrine, no, no, not the theology of, of justification, is that it's enough agreement that at least on this issue, the disagreements we have need not block church fellowship. Well, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin and this is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological and historical complexity. Today, I have the absolute privilege of being joined by Dr. Michael Root, who was one of the drafters of the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, an agreement between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church on the foundational doctrine of justification. He has a wealth of insight into the background of it, everything from stories about Cardinal Ratzinger calling up a friend and saying, let's knock this thing out, to talking about wine country and where the document was written. It's just a fascinating conversation to get to have the privilege of talking to someone who was there on the ground writing this document, but then also being able to talk about the key doctrinal points, where agreement exists, where disagreement persists, and what we can do about that today. So if you enjoy that kind of thing, I think you'll love this interview. And if you enjoy these conversations, I want to encourage you to consider signing up to become a patron and supporting this channel to help it keep going and growing so that I can bring you more conversations like this. If you're interested in that, you can go to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity. Well, today I'm joined by Dr. Michael Root. Dr. Michael Root is a native of Norfolk, Virginia. He studied at Dartmouth College for his undergraduate, graduating summa cum laude, and Yale University to, for his PhD in theology. He has taught at Davidson College, Trinity Lutheran Seminary, Lutheran Theological Southern Seminary. As well, uh, for 10 years, he was a research professor at the Institute for Ecumenical Research in Strasbourg, France. Ecumenical dialogues have been at the center of Dr. Root's service. He was on the drafting team for the Catholic Lutheran Joint De Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, which we'll be talking about today, and served on the Catholic Lutheran Dialogue both nationally and internationally, the International Lutheran Anglican Dialogue and the U.S. Lutheran Methodist Dialogue. He was a staff consultant to the 1993 Conference on Faith and Order in Spain and the 1998 Lambeth Conference in England. He has been the executive director of the Center for Catholic and Evangelical Theology. Having formerly been a Lutheran, Dr. Root was received into the Catholic Church in 2010. He is also the author of several books. He's co-authored uh, Affirmations and Admonitions uh, with, you might have to help me with his last name, Gabriel, how do you say his last name? Facker. Facker, okay. And editor of Justification by Faith with Carl Lamon and William Roush, Baptism and Unity of the Church with Rizzo Saarinen, and with James Buckley, Sharper Than a Two-Edged Sword, Preaching, Teaching, and Living the Bible, The Morally Divided Body, Ethical Disagreement and the Divided Church, and Christian, Christian Theology and Islam. To say the least, you've been a very busy scholar over the years, and I am so grateful for your time here today, Dr. Root, as we talk about the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. It's my pleasure. Well, I am certainly excited for this one. I remember first hearing about this mysterious acronym JDDJ on a class, uh, for a class on ecumenism, and it's great to be able to talk about it here today. And so for those who maybe find themselves in the seat that I was not too long ago, having maybe heard of this four-letter acronym and not really sure what it's all about, I try to keep the channel as accessible as I can while getting into fairly uh, complex topics. So for those that are just completely uninitiated, they're just jumping in, they're hearing this thing, JDDJ, or Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, what is it? The Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification is an official agreement on the Doctrine of Justification between the Roman Catholic Church, on the one hand, and the Lutheran World Federation and almost all of its member churches, signed in 1999. Since then, it, is, it has been affirmed by the World Communion of Reformed Churches, the Anglican Communion, and the World Methodist Alliance. So it is basically an official agreement between the churches on um, the doctrine of justification, how we stand acquitted before the judgment of God. It's a really fascinating project, and I can only imagine how much work it took. And while we're going to be focusing primarily on the document itself and its 
implications and impact today, I do think people will be interested to get a little bit of a peek behind the curtain, if you will, with the fact that you were on the drafting team. And so how did that come about for you? And what was that like, that whole process? Yeah, let, me, let me say something about the background um, and why why this text at all anyway, and how the process sort of worked, which, which was complicated. Um, following World War II to a degree, and then even more after Vatican II, you had these miscellaneous ecumenical dialogues between particularly Catholics and Lutherans. I was a Lutheran at the time. Um, and what they found, first in an international dialogue, then in a United States dialogue, then in a German dialogue, perhaps surprisingly, perhaps not, we can talk about that, was that Lutherans and Catholics could reach a certain significant, not complete, but significant level of agreement and justification. Uh, and this got a certain amount of play. Um, but the problem is theological dialogues are just professors talking. And despite the professor's self-image of how great and important we are, uh, they don't necessarily carry any weight. And other professors could just say, that's just a bunch of professors talking. Uh, that's not the right stuff. So there was a move in the, the German discussion was in the mid 80s. There was a move in the late 80s, early 90s. Can we move beyond just the professors talking to the churches officially affirming the conclusion of the dialogues? Well, the dialogues are these massive 80, 90 page texts. I mean, churches don't make that kind of judgment. So I needed to produce a relatively short text. The, the joint declaration is about 48 paragraphs, maybe 15, 20 pages long, um, which the churches were asked to at least in principle affirm. Uh, now we can come back and discuss what affirming meant. That it became to be an issue in and of itself. Um, there was a complication in that the, the Roman Catholic Church makes decisions at the worldwide level. So there had to be the Vatican had to make the decision. Lutheran churches, there is a Lutheran World Federation, but doctrinal decisions are made at the national level, the member church level. So there had to be a series of drafts circulated on the Lutheran side to all the member churches, get feedback, do another draft, send it back. So there was a great deal of um, back and forth. It was not a simple process. I was engaged not in the first, there were four drafts, the, counting the final draft. I was not engaged in the first two drafts, which included very small committees. One was just four, one was just two people, one Lutheran, one Catholic. Um, but once we got to the last stages, there were much larger committees, um, perhaps to save money. I, they wanted a North American Lutheran and I was living in Strasbourg, France, working at the Ecumenical Institute of the Lutheran World Federation. Because I was the, the institute's director, I'd already been engaged in the planning process. And odd as it may sound, the general secretary of the Lutheran World Federation didn't read German. Uh, he was a Zimbabwean, nor did the head of the ecumenical office of the Vatican. So the, the drafting process was being done in German, but they wanted a simultaneously produced English translation. So they put on the team one Catholic, one Lutheran, Jared Wicks, an American teaching in Rome. I was an American working for the LWF in France, and our responsibility was to produce the English translation as they were producing the German text while participating in the meeting. Um, it was some of the more tiring days in my life. I'm sure it was, but what a huge project to get to be a part of. I mean, it's oh, yes, quite right. a milestone. So I, I hope it was worth the uh, the long days. Oh, yes, and it was, worth, it was worth the effort, but I was beat. I, I imagine <laughs> so. Yeah, the rest of the team would do all their work all day, and we were doing this uh, in the guest house of the Bishop of Wurzburg in Germany, which is in wine country. Uh, the bishop still owns vineyards. I mean, so he has his own wine. So they were, you know, the long home day work, a late dinner. They would then sit there drinking wine. Jared and I would have to go work on the English translation, which was a pain in the neck. And sometimes, I must say, we'd come back and say, you've handled a certain issue in a, in a rather careful way that works in German, but not in English. So they'd have to redo the German a little bit. Yeah, I was wondering, there's always an aspect of difficulty moving from one language to another there. And so trying to do that so quickly, but also with the language of the JDDJ is very precise. And I imagine at times it could feel like walking a tightrope trying to make these things happen. In both, I'm sure. And in both cases, in, there's enough on the technical language of justification enough back and forth between English and German anyway, that it wasn't too difficult. I think at the end, Jared and I only decided we only really made one mistake, 
translation. Uh, and it was a technical German mistake on a very minor point that we had just forgotten. Um, there's a point at which it should say sin and it should, says sins in the plural. Uh, but that was just an ending problem. Um, but on the whole, um, it, it was tricky, but there was enough similarity in the discussions that it wasn't too much. It wasn't it wasn't that bad. Well, I hope that you all were able to enjoy wine country when it was all over there. Um, <laughs> yeah. But speaking of it being tricky, I, I want to get into something that you kind of uh, mentioned briefly there. That So there's very different structures between the Lutheran World Federation and the Roman Catholic Church. And the approval process, therefore, was a bit different. And it's my understanding that the approval process went a bit quicker on the Lutheran side and then hit a fairly substantial snag at the Vatican level with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Yeah. If I have that right, could, could you talk through that a bit and how that went? The difficulties, there were difficulties on both sides. This was unprecedented, um, particularly on the Lutheran side. The Lutheran side, the, there were two, there was a technical problem, a, an organizational problem and a substantive problem. The organizational problem um, was simply getting affirmations from there were about 100, at that time, I think about 120 member churches in the LWF. Um, that's a lot of churches. Um, it was, we never, we never guessed, we never thought we would get a response from every single member church. I mean, there, there are a lot of very small churches. There's also significant linguistic problems. I mean, we, we produced versions in English and German. Um, I think rather quickly a Spanish version was produced. But for example, Japanese or Chinese, uh, that was beyond the capability of the official offices. Um, there, that's, that was the substantive problem. The, the, I mean, that's the formal problem. The conceptual problem was there was significant dissent within Germany. Um, there was a vigorous debate within the German Lutheran churches. Um, well, for the last drafting sessions, we asked the German Lutheran churches to, to appoint their own representative on the drafting committee so we would have the negative voice heard. Unfortunately, the, the other really large dissenting voice was Finland, and the Finland and the Finns and the Germans dissented from opposite sides. They wanted they both wanted to change, but in opposite directions. Um, and and the 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 process, so the, the Lutheran process was complicated and was done, and was done publicly. I mean, it was all done. This was all done out in the open. The Vatican process was different, but had its own complications. There's an ecumenical office in the Vatican, Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, and they do all the dialogues. But they don't make doctrinal decisions. That's the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And the problem was the handoff, so to speak, between the Pontifical Council and the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. There was a failure of communication. Um, the Lutheran staff person that did all the work on this had stayed two or three years beyond retirement to finish up the work, and then he retired when the last draft was done. The German staff person who did it all died of bone cancer, I'm afraid, two months after we finished. He had willed himself alive heroically to finish the text. So the staff people engaged both were gone. Uh, and and they, they're failed, there was a failure of agreement on what constituted saying yes to the text. Um, the Lutheran side, there are two crucial conclusions, that there is a consensus on basic truths of the doctrine of justification, and that the condemnations in, our, in both the Lutheran and the Catholic official texts don't apply to what the other church is saying here. So the, the condemnations in the Council of Trent don't condemn what is here said to be Lutheran teaching and vice versa. For the Lutheran side, it was understood to say, yes, you've really got to say both. And the Vatican decided they would just say yes initially to the basic consensus point, but not to the condemnations not applying. And then they were really surprised when the Lutherans, I mean, I was in the meeting, when the Lutherans said, no, 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 this is not going to work. We cannot go back and say, we're gonna sign it on the basis of, of your, what is to us, simply partial agreement. Part of the problem also on the Catholic side was that the, cat, the text had been circulated by the Pontifical Council at the middle stage to those conferences of bishops in the Catholic Church where there were a lot of Lutherans. 
Germany, the United States, Scandinavia, but not to Italy, not to Spain, not to France. Well, to France, yes, but not to Latin America. So you had these a lot of Catholic bishops on the, the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith with very little experience of Protestantism. I mean, if, if you're the Catholic Bishop of Cordoba, you don't, I mean, Protestants, you know, Lutherans, you know, they may have changed planes in Frankfurt once, and that's as close as they ever got. Um, and there you ran into some some difficulties we can talk about. But, and, and we were stymied, I must say, but it was an intervention personally by Cardinal Rotzinger. He's a Bavarian. He called up his old friend, the Bavarian Lutheran bishop, who had been president of the Lutheran Federation. And he said, you know, why don't, you know, I'm, I'm on vacation up in Bavaria. Um, call a theologian friend of yours and I'll call a theologian friend of mine and we'll sit down on the weekend and work this out. <laughs> Unfortunately, or unfortunately, he didn't tell anybody he was doing this. Uh, this was out of the blue. I mean, I got a call from Geneva from the Lutheran Federation. They suddenly get this this at the annex, this thing added on that sort of cleanses up the problems a bit. Um, and they were just flabbergasted. But I must say, Rothsinger was committed to having this happen. Um, and so there is a kind of, there is an annex attached, um, which says a few additional things. Um, I don't think it actually changes things very much, actually. Um, but then it, it went ahead and got signed, uh, affirming both crucially the basic consensus on the doctrine and the non-applicability of the condemnations. It's no secret that today, perhaps more than ever, people are struggling with their mental health. I think if I asked you all to virtually raise your hand and said, hey, are you currently struggling? Have you ever, do you consistently struggle with mental health, be it anxiety, depression, or whatever? I think many of us, myself included, would raise our hand and say, yeah, like things get hard sometimes and sometimes it feels like more than we can handle. But the problem is despite facing these difficult circumstances and dealing with these mental health crises at times, so few of us end up actually getting the help that we need. It might be because it can take so long to get into a counselor or therapist or you think it's going to be too much or maybe there's this thought in the back of your head that Christians aren't allowed to have mental health problems. And does that mean there's something wrong with me? Well, from the beginning of my channel, far before it had any type of reach or influence, I have wanted to help do my part to help end that stigma. That's why one of my first videos I ever made was titled, You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. Hoping that that would give people the permission to go out and get the help they need without being worried about these shameful stigmas that people have attached to it. Well, now I am so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling, who is who are leading the charge in helping people get the help they need. Rather than having to wait months to get into a counselor, if you sign up for Faithful Counseling, you can be paired with a counselor in 24 hours or less. I don't know if you've ever attempted to do something like this through traditional avenues, but if you have, you know just how crazy it is to be able to pair up with someone that quickly. All of their counselors are licensed and have over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with them in flexible ways. You can do uh, video sessions, phone calls, uh, private messaging. It is really fantastic. They even have a live chat. It is such an amazing service. I'm so excited to be partnering with them and I'd really encourage you to check them out. I'm going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do so, you'll get 10% off your first month and I think it will be really, really helpful for you. Now, I do want to say that this isn't a crisis line, and if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, I would encourage you so, so much to not go through this alone, but to reach out to a crisis line. I'll put one on the screen here. But if you are looking for mental health help, I think Faithful Counseling could be great for you. They will connect you with a Christian counselor, and I know people come to my channel from a variety of backgrounds, so if you want one specifically from your Christian denomination, they will work with you to try to make that happen so that you can get Christian mental health help. I think it's going to be fantastic for you. I can't wait for you to check it out. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. You get 10% off your first month. After that, it'll be $260 per month, but there is financial aid available for those who qualify. Once again, guys, don't hesitate to get the help, help you need. FaithfulCounseling.com slash Gospel Simplicity. The whole backstory to this is fascinating, especially then Cardinal Rat. I would be, it was Cardinal at the time, right? He was Cardinal, Cardinal Ratzinger. He was not Cardinal. Yeah. 
uh, at the time and his role in it. it. It's fascinating to get to hear, and I'm, I'm so grateful for you being able to share some of that. You mentioned that this was difficult for some of the Lutherans, and I just want to uh, clarify this for a couple people who might not be as familiar with kind of like the inner workings of the Lutheran Church. So there's the Lutheran World Federation, which you said represented about 120 uh, member churches. And then there was some dissent in different parts. You mentioned Germany and Finland. I think maybe a bit closer to home for some of my American audience would be the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, I think, I, LCMS? Yes. And I believe there was some significant disagreement there. So in terms of American churches, is there like a rough maybe percentage of Lutherans that were signing on, or um, what was the maybe situation in America with the reception of this document? At the time the document was done, almost all American Lutherans belonged to one of two Lutheran churches, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which takes in about two thirds of American Lutheranism, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which takes in about one third. Uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is the only large Lutheran church in the world that doesn't belong to the LWS. Uh, so, in fact, I mean, they, because they're not a member of the Lutheran World Federation, they were entirely outside the process. I mean, their opinion was never asked, to tell you the truth, um, uh, because they weren't LWF members. Um, so there is an official LWF statement, which pretty much, I would say, repeats some of the German problems. Um, uh, so in America, the... At the, at, at, so the ELCA was the one who actually voted on it. There was never a sort of formal vote, so to speak, in the, EL, in the Missouri Senate. Oddly, in the LC, ELCA, there was also an ecumenical proposal to enter Episcopal succession by full communion with the Episcopal Church. And that's what got the debate, not the joint declaration. I, I think, at, I mean, I was there at the, at the assembly that voted on it. I think many Lutherans were simply surprised at how Lutheran the joint declarations sounds. The typical layperson would read, you know, we're saved entirely by grace. You know, Catholic Church teaches that? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, always it has. Um, but they weren't into the sort of detailed issues. So there really was not, certainly to a certain degree among theologians, but it didn't capture, it didn't capture anything like the attention it did in Germany. I mean, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung in one of the largest papers in the country, um, had two front page editorials on the joint declaration. In fact, raising doubts about the joint declaration. Uh, um, I mean, I can't imagine the New York Times running front page editorials on ecumenical statements. <laughs> and we should also note there's a problem in Germany in that many Lutherans, people who were called themselves Lutheran in Germany, belong to united churches, where in the 19th century under state pressure, reformed and Lutherans merged. And those churches, whereas they're free to join the Lutheran World Federation, have never done so. So they think of themselves as Lutheran, but were outside the process. And that was part of the inner German problem. That's really interesting. I can imagine, and maybe I'm painting too much on this, but there could be a sense of maybe an identity issue with a document like the JDDJ for certain Lutherans, insofar as if at maybe a popular level you define yourself as yeah. not Catholic, yeah, and right. specifically on the issue of justification, and all of a sudden you're right. going to say you agree, that could just be unsettling in its own oh, way. Sure. Uh, but it and is there fascinating. There certainly were, um, at a sort of popular level, I mean, this is apocryphal, but allegedly in the meeting in a meeting of the French Lutheran Church, there was somebody who stood up and said he wasn't, he didn't. He wasn't up on all these details, but it was really important that the Lutheran Church teach something the Catholic Church would condemn. <laughs> I mean, uh, at a more at a more sophisticated level, I remember um, a German theologian, you know, pressing the point a little bit to me over coffee. I mean, Luther says at one point that if the if the Pope would permit the true preaching of the gospel, he would not only kiss his ring but kiss his feet. Um, well, if we agreeing on justification, does this mean we all need to go, you know, now kiss the Pope's ring, kiss the Pope's feet? Um, there was a certain shock value. But again, I would note there had been, since World War II, um, a whole series of ecumenical agreements. And in fact, even in the 16th century, the Diet of Augsburg, the first attempt really to sort of negotiate an end to the Reformation, it appears they were pretty much ready to get an agreement on justification. The issue was the power of the bishops. Um, and at Regensburg in 1540, 
41. Now, you had an agreement that neither side back home, neither Wittenberg or Rome, much liked. But again, you had agreement. I mean, it's not. In fact, it wasn't so unprecedented for Lutherans and Catholics to find a way, at least at a certain level of generality, to agree on the doctrine of justification. But it was unsettling, no doubt about that. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it is really interesting to see the historical attempts there and wonder what might have been. But here yeah. we are, and we, we do have this agreement now. I'd like to dive in maybe to some of the doctrinal points of, of the text itself now, right. shift a bit that direction. And to start, though, I'd like to talk about kind of the form and structure of it, because it's one of the most interesting elements to me. I think the, the very way it's laid out speaks to the approach taken and maybe the thoughts around what ecumenism is and what the JDDG, JDDJ is doing. And so it roughly follows something like, you know, in part four, you'll have explicating the common understanding of justification, and then it will proceed, we confess together, then when Catholics say X, Y, Z, and when Lutherans say X, Y, Z, you know, saying that, okay, here's what we confess together. This is kind of the Catholic language around that. This is the Lutheran language around that. They might use different terminology, but we're getting at a similar confession. At least that's the way I read the document. Can you talk to me a bit about how that speaks to what's being done there? Because I think it allows for this common statement, but then brings to light the fact that we do say these things maybe in different ways at times. Yeah. Um, there is a definite structure and method to the text. Um, an introductory section, a biblical section, and actually section three tries to lay out really what we say in common most clearly. Paragraph 15, which we might look at later, was really meant to be the, the core agreement. Then section four, as you noted, takes seven difficult topics, where they've been traditionally they've been arguments, says what we can say together, and then notes the distinct Lutheran and Catholic subpositions, so to speak. And the clear hope is that people will see, yeah, there's some real differences here, but they're not anywhere near as important as what's agreed upon. Um, I mean, this method is, has come to be called differentiated consensus. Not only is there a consensus, there's a consensus that we need consensus on X, but not on a Y. Now, actually, I think that's just common sense. I mean, when you're going to have in a, in a group an agreement on some teaching, let's say, you don't need to settle every single detailed question. Uh, in any doctrinal issue, I mean, doctrine is different from theology. Doctrine is a matter of official church teaching. Theology stuff we argue about in theology classes and stuff and that sort of thing. Um, even on a really important doctrine like the Incarnation, they're detailed questions. There's no official church teaching on and people disagree. It's official church teaching. Jesus is fully human. Official church teaching, Catholic and Orthodox at any rate, that he has a fully human intellect and a fully human will joined with the will and intellect of God. Now, when Jesus' mother, when he was 10 years old, asked him, was it raining outside? I mean, did he just know because he's God? Or did he have a human intellect and thus looked out the window? Actually, you'll find debates on this question. Um, but there's no official church teaching. This isn't the sort of thing we need to have an agreement on. So implicit in the joint declaration is the attempt to reach an agreement where we need an agreement. If we have this much of an agreement, can we function as one church? while still having disagreements on certain detailed issues. Now there is a certain, there are two ways of reading the text. One way, which I think the text to a certain degree encourages, is, is sort of the way you did it. We're saying the same thing in different words. Now I actually argued that it wouldn't read this way, <laughs> that, but I didn't win this argument. Um, that it'd be clear that on detailed questions, sometimes we're not saying the same things in different words. On detailed questions, we really disagree. Um, but those are details we can live with, like um, did Jesus need to look out the window to know if it's raining? Um, there are people I know um, who, who get really worked up on this question. It's really important to say he needed to look out the window to know if it was raining, and people think, no, 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 you're denying the incarnation if you say that. Um, but it's not the sort of thing we need an agreement on. So the implicit method of the joint declaration on the doctrine, no, no, not the theology of of justification, is that it's enough agreement 
that at least on this issue, the disagreements we have need not block church fellowship. Now, on other things, it may be there's still lots of stuff that blocks fellowship, but on this issue, there isn't. So that is the the method of the text. It's not accidental. It was very clearly thought through from the start. That's really interesting to get to hear your perspective on that, because it's a helpful hermeneutic for me. I, I'm intrigued to go back to the text and read it again, because I had approached it as, okay, we're both saying this, and we say it kind of differently, but this is what we mean. Whereas there is an opportunity to read the text as allowing that uh, differentiated consensus. That's a really great term there, in which we agree like substantially on this important doctrine here. And then we have disagreements in theology, and it's the kind of things that theologians can get you know, together over coffee and proceed to disagree about for several hours while they put the people next to them asleep. And I, I think that's really fascinating. I'm intrigued to go back to that because one criticism that I hear in levied towards this document or just ecumenical dialogue in general is that it can result in kind of this wordsmithing to a point where we're able to say, hey, we do say these things completely differently, but, but trust me, we mean the same things. And so I think this is an opportunity to read that differently. Is that a fair way of putting that, you'd say? That's certainly fair. No, I must admit, the text to a certain degree does read a sort of, I would say, we're saying the same thing in different words kind of way. I thought that was a mistake, but I lost the argument. Um, it's open, however, to my reading, but it isn't suggested. Um, there certainly are places in the text. I mean, we might come later to looking at the discussion about symbiosis et peccato, or sinful and just at the same time, where a crucial question is, are, is concupiscence, that is, desires or motions of the self, that is, thoughts and motions, that are prior to my willing anything, that just pop up, even if I don't want them to pop up, they pop up. Are they sins? I mean, if, if a typical professor's sin is envy, all professors are envious. Somebody else gets an award and the thought pops in the back of my mind, that suck up. I mean, they just gets, you know, blah, 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 blah. I do the same work they did. Now, I may repress that. I may do, I mean, you know, that's envy, that's wrong. I should just not do that. But have I sinned, so to speak, in having that thought emotion? Lutherans would tend to say yes. Catholics would, send to tend to, would definitely say no. Lutherans would definitely say yes. Now, there are reasons. We can talk about it a bit. There's actually reasonable argument, I think, on both sides. Um, and it's rooted in, in various things St. Augustine said. But unfortunately, he can be read two ways. Um, so there are there disagreements. I won't deny that in some texts, ecumenical texts, there is a kind of playing fast and loose with meanings. I do think it's important to distinguish generality from ambiguity. I mean, ambiguity is where, two, where, where a word simply means different things to different people. Generality would be you're, you're, you're up at a certain level of generality where if you would do, where you mean the same thing at that level of generality, but when you get more detailed, then you're going to get into some disagreements. Uh, I would say the goal of the Joint Declaration, is that in section four, where you get this, we confess together, Catholics say, Lutherans say, it, the, the together statement is meant to be univocal. We mean the words the same way. But when we work out a detailed explanation, we hit places where we use different language, at the very least, or perhaps on detailed questions. We just disagree, but we can live with a disagreement. I think that's really helpful. That might segue into, you might have already answered the question I'm going to ask here, um, but perhaps if so, we can dive into it a bit deeper. I, I, there's several sections to it, uh, seven, in fact, which is a great number. Uh, there's human powerlessness and sin, justification as forgiveness of sins and making righteous, uh, justification by faith through grace, the justified as sinner, law and gospel, assurance of salvation, and the good works of the justified. Now, judging by the annex, I'm guessing that it's that idea of uh, the justified as sinner. I think, uh, yes, that is oh, the yeah. section there. That was most uh, significant or most difficult. I is that accurate? I and if so, what was that like? There were two issues. Well, two issues that were most difficult. One actually isn't in section seven. It's the question of, is justification the criterion 
by which the church stands and falls. That was a difficult issue on both sides. The Catholics saying, absolutely not. To some degree, the Lutherans wanting it more firmly stated. But certainly in the in the drafting, more time than anything else, and a great deal of in the debate within Lutheranism and within Catholicism, had to do with the similiosis of Picado or justified and sinner. Uh, one can see in the text the Lutheran paragraph is that's the Lutheran paragraph on that question is the longest paragraph in the entire text. That's because the Lutherans had a great deal of difficulty agreeing on what on how to state the Lutheran position. I mean, there are ambiguities within Lutheranism on the question. Um, a real problem is that at a certain level, the two positions can be just incomprehensible to the other. I mean, a, a Lutheran might say, of course we're sinners. We, I mean, that's empirically obvious, isn't it? I mean, how could they say we're not, we who are justified are not also sinners? This just seems self-delusional. Whereas a Catholic would say, looking particularly at, at baptism, I mean, I remember, the Catholic cardinal asking me, uh, now, he said, I want to get the Luther position right. I mean, you have this two-week-old baby, and we baptize the baby, and we say the baptism is now in Christ, the child is now in Christ, cleansed from sin, but somehow it's still a sinner. I said, well, yeah, yeah, that's a Luther position. And he said, well, I just don't understand. How can the baby be a sinner? Or, or you're denying, denying baptismal regeneration, that baptism in fact cleanses from sin. And I said, no, 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 we're not saying that. We're not saying we're not denying that baptism cleanses from sin. So there is a kind of deep mutual incomprehension. And I think in particular, my guess is that the reaction of the congregation of the doctrine of the faith on this issue was a certain degree of incomprehension in the very idea. Um, the, the agreement, finally, it is particularly I noted earlier, this issue of is concupiscence sort of desires that pop up, but you you don't cooperate with them which Catholics would say is if you don't cooperate at all, it's not sin. Lutherans say it is sin. Um, that lies behind some of the issues. I think, I mean, in the text, we agree. Baptism does, in fact, unite you with Christ. We are always tempted by sin. When well, actually, when we look at the text, there are four things that are fairly clearly said. It's not laid out as four, but it's implicit. We're cleansed by, I mean, it's four, four. We're cleansed by baptism. We're united with Christ. Um, power of sin attacks us. There are still disordered desires, which are uh, which are contrary to God. And it doesn't say they're sin, but they're not what God designs for humanity. And we're always called to greater conversion and penitence. Catholics would never deny that there are sins which do not destroy your relation with God, but which are sinful, venial sins during every day. Um, Catholics don't deny, take heed lest ye fall. We can always slip. Um, they don't deny that, that our, our desires or thoughts are still disordered. So we can, we can agree there. But now when you get to the more detailed question, just what is and isn't sin? For the Catholic Church, I mean, first John says, we are called children of God and we are. Well, I mean, the Catholic way, we are children of God. I mean, if we are, we are. And I think in Catholic discourse in particular, sin and justice are simply opposites. I mean, they're contraries. You can't, contradictories. You can't be both at the same time. I mean, that's P and not P, both being true, violates the law, the law of self-contradiction. Um, so there was a real smash. Um, and there, I think there is simply a straightforward disagreement on how to apply the word sin. However, there's also a great deal a fundamental agreement on the Christian life, the justified or truly in Christ, neither Lutheran nor Catholic would disagree that we're called to the Christian life. There are things you can do in your life that destroy your relation with, with God, um, mortal sins, whether you use the word or not, there, there are actions which break off your being in grace. Um, and well, I'll leave it at that. I mean, and so there's a great deal of agreement at the sort of particularly the first level basic discourse of Christian practice in life is when you get to certain technical questions, which are not trivial, but need not in themselves block church fellowship. I think that's 
going to be helpful for people to be able to hear, especially as one of the drafters, say that th there is like there are sticking points here. Oh yeah. But they don't raise necessarily to that level of breaking fellowship because I, I think we do ec ec ecumenical dialogue a disservice when we kind of paint with too broad of a brush or kind of sweep those things under the rug. I, I find that the people that I speak to that are a bit more suspicious of ecumenical dialogue feel that maybe some of their concerns aren't being heard or being kind of painted too broad. But I think if we're able to differentiate there between that substantial agreement and then allow space for that disagreement on things that aren't trivial, as you said, but don't necessarily rise to that level of breaking fellowship, I think that's a helpful way of moving forward. There was, I can say that in the writing, I mentioned earlier, there's, there's two crucial claims. There's a, there's a consensus in basic truths. The condemnations in our confessional documents don't apply. We had lists of the condemnations um, because they're, they're listed in the Council of Trent, the decree on justification. And in fact, it was my job to go through the Lutheran confessions and pick out all the condemnations. <laughs> um, so it was, it was sort of my list that had been produced that was sitting there. And we did pay attention to that with some care. Now, I would say second, and this is a real problem. How do you tell the difference between a disagreement that's compatible with fellowship and a disagreement that's not compatible with fellowship? One will note, that's never explained in the Joint Declaration. And in chapter four, where you've noted there is this, we say together, we say apart, there's never any argument given why these separate statements don't aren't more important than the than the agreement. It's just it's just trusting you'll see it, so to speak. Um, this is a real failure of ecumenical theology. I about 30 years or so ago, when I was in working for the Lutheran Federation, I figured, you know, this is an important question. How do you tell the difference? There must be a literature on this. And there isn't. There's hardly any, except for some discussion of fundamental articles or things, which which doesn't help. As I've noted, Christology is a fundamental article, but there are issues in Christology. We, we don't think we have to have official teaching on. There's a real problem there. And I think a lot of the, not all, but some of the disagreement is over how significant or what sort of disagreement stands in the way of church fellowship. Certainly in the United States to go all the way back a while, the Missouri Synod, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has always had a very high bar that is, you need a lot of agreement to be in church fellowship, lots. I mean, so they weren't even, they weren't in church fellowship with other Lutherans. Um, the official position of the Lutheran World Federation is that there's church fellowship among churches that affirm the Logsburg Confession, basic Lutheran text and Luther's small catechism. And we're not gonna come in and find out exactly how you enforce them or anything. You affirm the text, we're in fellowship. That's a rather low bar. Um, so that's part of the issue. Is, is how to make this differentiation. And um, I think to a, great to a great degree, ecumenism is just flown by the seat of its pants. Yeah, well, this, this doesn't look big enough to be a disagreement that'll block fellowship, and this one over here does. Some cases are obvious, but some aren't. I can't refrain myself from asking, as someone that's deeply interested in this and is more or less what I'm doing on the channel. It, it's a it's a snag that I've found in dialogues as well. And specifically, there is this common understanding, at least I hear often from Protestants, it might often come on the Catholic side as well, of, well, it's about agreeing at the fundamental level, at the dogma level and distinguishing like dogma, dogma, doctrine, opinion, or, yeah. and you, I too have not found a coherent list of everyone agrees that this is what that is, right? And, nope. and it's nope. just self-evident. That seems to be a, a major, major problem. Do and, you and see the, any way forward on that? Um, well, I, may, I, I would argue, let me say two things. First, the fundamental doctrine sort of approach I think doesn't work. Because remember, we're not relating groups of doctrines, we're relating churches, actual Christian communities who do things. Now, I don't think anyone would say that if you were to do an abstract discussion of Christian doctrine, 
whether or not you ordain both men and women is a fundamental question. I mean, most systematic theology books never raise the question. But if, say, the Church of England or the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, half of their pastors are women, and the Catholic Church does not recognize women clergy, then how do they enter into fellowship when the Catholic Church doesn't recognize the ministry of half of the Lutheran ministers? I mean, this is going to be, you know, the men, the men, the male clergy can go and 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 do ministerial things in the Catholic Church, but the women can't. That's not going to fly. <laughs> um, um, I mean, you don't have to be a radical feminist to recognize that's just not going to work. So the question isn't just fundamental. There can be something that's actually, in an abstract theological sense, not all that basic. But you're you're just not going to, unless you can solve this, you just can't live together as one church. Um, I would make a, a certain, I think an important criterion is pragmatic. What do you have to do to do together that which churches must do together to be one church? I mean, for example, a question about Eucharistic presence or say even more the sacrifice of the mass. I would say an interesting test. Do you have enough agreement on the nature of the mass or the Lord's Supper to be in fellowship is, well, can you work out a full liturgy you would both use most of the time um, that says all you think needs to be said in a, in a Lord's Supper service? If you can, if you can work out a complete liturgy, that I would say, and you know, and these everybody's comfortable with it. Fundamental convictions, not not nothing's in the way. You've said what you think needs to be said. If you can work out the liturgy, then it seems to me the other questions aren't church dividing. If you can do together that which you think you must do together to be one church. Now, I wouldn't say that's an absolute covers everything, but at least it gives one some criterion of distinguishing church dividing from non-church dividing questions. We certainly need to do more work on it. I'm certainly intrigued, and I, I appreciate that pragmatic approach, especially to this question of churches coming together. I mean, yeah. you highlight very well that some things that we might put in the fundamental, or some things that we might not put in the fundamental category will be pragmatically just roadblocks right. that you're not going to overcome them. And so it seems that we need an approach that works in light of the problem. And so I, I think that's helpful. I hope people have some food for thought with that. There's one more question that I want to ask specifically about uh, at the doctrinal level for the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. And as I was writing this question, on the one hand, it seems that, well, maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that this idea of sanctification doesn't come up and a doctrine on justification. After all, it is in the title. But then again, as I thought about from a Protestant perspective on this question of uh, the Roman Catholic and Lutheran World Federation's views on justification, it seemed that sanctification would have a role in how we think about how justification applies to things, maybe even like that question of simul usus et peccatore. Right. And so I found it at least intriguing that in my word search of the document, I believe sanctification only appears once and it's in a note. I'm curious, was that intentional to leave that big question of how those two doctrines relate to each other apart from this because that would bog it down? Or is it is there some sense of agreement actually on how those two yeah. work together such that it wasn't necessary to put in? The word isn't there because it's not prominent in the Lutheran or Catholic doctrinal statements. Simply put, that's the reason the word isn't there. Um, in fact, the topic is there. In fact, it's 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 there with a great deal of regularity. I mean, in some sense, the sanctification issue is crucial on the simul usus et peccator. There's also the statement about the necessity of good works and the role good works play in judgment. That's the sanctification kind of question. Also, at the very beginning, there's the question, justification by faith through grace. I mean, often you'll hear it said, the Catholic position on justification is transfer is transformational. You're made just. Protestant position is forensic. You're declared just. So actually, I mean, the topic, although not the word, isn't treated individually any place in the text, but it's spread out a number of places. Um, let me say something then about the way it's treated. There is here, I think, a Catholic, generally Protestant, but more specifically Lutheran issue that is important. And I, but I think oddly 
the differences are more important on other topics than they are on justification. Um, about how the human person as an agent, as a doer of things, is engaged in salvation. Both Lutherans and Catholics will agree justification is transformational. That is, there's a change in the person that occurs at justification. Luther doesn't deny that. Um, when he says we should grow in righteousness day by day. Uh, sin is being curved in on yourself. Faith is precisely not being curved in on yourself. It's looking toward God. So everybody agrees justification is transformational. But, but what is the justice that avails before the judgment of God? For Luther, it has nothing to do with the transformation in you. It's really transformational, of course. But it's strictly only the justice of Christ imputed to you forensically, so in a judge court kind of way. The Catholic position is no. Um, it's the justice of Christ, the righteousness of Christ, which adheres in you and changes you. That's part of your, your standing before the judgment of God, so to speak. Not on your own. That that the qualities in you stand before the judgment of God is strictly a function of, of their being included in Christ, but they are transformed and they're a part of your justice, so to speak. That's an issue that comes off and on in the text and is always treated basically the same way. Let's see if I can find a place that it worked, that is particularly clear. Um, uh, I think it's in the good work section. Here. What's often said, and again, I can't find a text right off the bat, um, is that um, is that it is always said in the text. Well, let me give you an example. Paragraph 15. There's this is the sentence you figure you wanted a money sentence that that would be quoted, and it's the last sentence of, of 15. Together we confess by grace alone and faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part. We are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Now note, we are accepted by God entirely by merit, and we are renewed in our hearts and equipped for good works. These both occur. Now, Exactly the relationship between them is never defined in the text. Um, and that's true throughout. It's simultaneous. They're both always present. But so to speak, the exact question of how the two interrelate is left, so to speak, at the level of theology, not doctrine. Um, that would be. It never rose because it doesn't particularly. The text really was shaped by what's in the condemnations and the Lutheran confessions and the Council of Trent. Um, and we stuck, we wanted to, precisely because of the worry of sort of going off in loosey goosey kind of vague stuff, we try to stick close to the text. Um, that is that is an issue there. Um, and pretty much the solution is to insist faith, hope, and love always go together. Whether right, but but exactly how the say faith, hope, and love, and how they operate the Christian life, how they relate to justification, is left to a certain degree open. I must say that is the most striking sentence in the document to me, at least. I know oh, yeah. it's un underlined, highlighted in my <laughs> copy, it's and to be striking. <laughs> good, yeah. Well, it certainly succeeds, and I. I'll be sure to either put that on screen or put it in the description so that people can check that out specifically, not that they can't access it for free. Uh, but I think that's a, a very powerful sentence, and to the extent which that represents the, these two bodies, which has been affirmed, it really is amazing the level of agreement there. Now, of course, as you say, there's questions left in that that go somewhat unanswered in how those things relate together. Right. But if, if we can agree on something that substantial, I think it's, I, I find that to be quite monumental in, in that work. And, and let me say, and to some degree, I've gotten surprised on both sides. 
Protestants, Lutherans, surprised Catholics would say that, to which that's just straight Council of Trent. I mean, there's nothing there that isn't said in the Council of Trent. Well, Catholics are surprised. What's this renew our hearts stuff? I mean, I thought it was all, you know, it doesn't change you at all. I mean, I have to, I mean, when I was a Lutheran, I used to try and correct Lutheran mistakes about Catholicism. Now I am a Catholic. I try and correct Catholic mistakes about Lutherans. And you'll have these statements, you know, that it leaves you unchanged. Well, of course not. I mean, you can quote Luther all over the place. So I got to change. Justification makes, but it's not your justice. I mean, this. Uh, so actually, that statement shouldn't be controversial at all on either side. And hopefully it will cease to be at one point uh, yeah, yeah. When, right. when caricatures um, subside. And, right. I, you know, to the extent that it isn't striking to my audience, I, I'd say that, that's wonderful. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, I, I, I'm guessing that many might still find it surprising. And most of the work that I do on this channel is trying to help bring people together right. of different perspectives to hear it from the source and realize where that agreement is. Right. Um, and so I think that's helpful. As we begin to wrap up, one last thing on the doctrinal level that I want to ask is kind of a big picture of what the JDDJ is and it's not. And so you talk about sitting there with the anathemas from Trent and from different Lutheran documents and seeing, okay, can we navigate these in a way that there's agreement here? And I'm curious in how you would kind of summarize what the JDDJ is doing. Is it saying that Luther and you know the drafters at Trent, they they agreed. Maybe they didn't quite understand each other because right. of the you know circumstances going on. Maybe they weren't the the best time for dialogue. And I think we could maybe all understand that to some extent. Or is it that in the five hundred years since then, the way that the ch these two churches have come to understand these doctrines are compatible? in a way that maybe wasn't seen then, maybe wasn't, maybe was there in seed form, but wasn't fully fleshed out enough. What would you say it, it is saying and maybe isn't saying? It very carefully does not say the condemnations were wrong. I mean, it notes that, that if one says what Trent condemns, then that teaching is condemned by the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has no choice on that. I mean, this sort of, those are locked into place. Um, what is the case, as I mentioned, the, the Diet of Augsburg in 1521, Regensburg in 1540-41. Uh, it shouldn't be utterly surprising one can reach this kind of level of agreement at a certain level of generality. Um, what was the case was that the Reformation, of course, was not simply a theological movement, but a political movement and a social movement. And by the time, certainly by the time you hit Trent in 1546-47, when they write their text on justification, um, you had major groups, significant groups on both sides who did not want an agreement um, you had, and who didn't believe it was possible. Some of the problem here really is quite different languages of how they understand things so that there really were ships passing in the night on a good number of occasions. I do think there were issues beyond justification but closely related to it that are not raised in this text, which are problematic between the two churches. Um, but the will to agree, so to speak, the will to seek an agreement was certainly a minority position and a shrinking position as time went on by the time you hit the 1530s and 40s. So I would say um, the Joint Declaration is the realization of a potentiality on this issue that was always there, and you can see it there in the past if you look. But given, again, the justification that ecumenical relations are not first and foremost about concepts, but first and foremost about actual existing churches, uh, they were not going to come to a an agreement by the time you hit 1530 or 1540. Once again, that dimension of kind of the pragmatic element yeah. of that in between right. churches is very helpful there. And I think it's always helpful, as you mentioned, to see these not just as uh, conceptual problems, yeah. but 
problems between real people and real circumstances to not do this right. a historically right these doctrines and these documents weren't produced in a vacuum and their circumstances may not have been as um, friendly as it was in Germany and wine country in a time when people could you know have a nice uh, meal together and not be at war with one another right like I think there's certain um, elements to our own situatedness that allows us to even have these dialogues in a way that's going to be more productive. Um, yeah, I mean, and to give an example about the wine, I mean, the Bishop of Würzburg used to rule Würzburg. So in a number of German free cities, they didn't want an agreement with the Catholic Church because the bishop will come back and claim to be ruler. I mean, and, and we want the city council, the businessmen to run the, run the city, not the bishop. So, I mean, the ecumenical agreement sometimes had not to do with theology. It depended on who was going to run the city. At any rate, um, right. <laughs> yeah, and that's a practical concern. It probably right. shouldn't be our overriding concern, you know, if we want to speak about <laughs> no, it no, from. Precisely not. But it, I think we can at least understand how um, yeah. it could right. be difficult to look at that in a, you know, a purely right. objective way or whatever we want to say about that. This has been fantastic, Dr. Root. I, I'm so grateful for your time. I, I want to close before we do the just kind of final four questions with. A question of what's next. So obviously in your own story, there has been a, a significant change from where you were at when you were drafting this to where you're at today. And I'm sure that might shape some of how you'd answer this question. But from a sense of there has been this monumental work done in the JDDJ of, you know, justification is Calvin called it the hinge and uh, upon which all true religion turns. And Luther had a similar quote that I put in here somewhere that I don't see right yeah. now. Um, but in any case, it, I mean, it's such a significant thing it, from the Protestant perspective, surely, of justification. This is a, a hallmark issue. And, and this has been, at least in some ways, brought to a place of agreement, which is yeah. wonderful. Yet, we are over 20 years out from the signing of this document and the churches remain divided and it's not that i get the sense that anyone on this drafting committee thought that okay the day this is signed everyone's going to kind of be at mass together and everything's going to be good and the churches will be together immediately but what is next if we see this as a big step but not the last step what do you see as the next major issue to try to tackle yeah i think and this this isn't a function of so much of my becoming a catholic but just generally as an observer of the ecumenical scene. I do think, so to speak, the age of ecumenical breakthroughs is over. So we went through a period of revolutionary ecumenism, much changing. I think we're settling down now into stable patterns. The breakthroughs in the dialogues were mostly on relatively abstract theological issues, um, which didn't have immediate relationships to practice. Um, nothing changed in the practice of the Lutheran and Catholic churches because of the Joint Declaration. There was nothing that seemed immediately to need to change. Um, on soteriology issues, about salvation, we could reach agreement. But what all of the dialogues, Catholic Orthodox, Protestant Orthodox, Catholic Protestant of various sorts, when you turn to ecclesiology, to the nature of the church, one hits a wall. Um, on issues of ministry, issues of priesthood, and particular issues of authority. Uh, and, and as I noted, ecumenism is about relationship between concrete communities. Um, and if you can't solve the issues related to the nature of the concrete community, its leadership, how you make decisions in the community, that's going to be a really fundamental obstacle. And on those issues, there has really been almost no ecumenical progress. Um, in addition, since the Joint Declaration, although already underway at the time, you've now had sharpening differences, particularly in Catholics and many, but by no means all Protestants, over ethical issues, particularly ethical issues as relate to sexuality, initially issues of ordination of just men or men and women, issues now relating to gender practices, abortion, um, these aren't trivial, and whereas even as a Lutheran, I'd have to sometimes go into go to a congregation and explain the Lutheran doctrine of justification to them and why it's important. The person in the pew often has a strong view on abortion and thinks it's important, um, as we can see in contemporary politics. Um, so the churches, in some ways, have gotten have not 
made progress on ecclesiology issues and on some ethical issues, they've in fact moved significantly apart on hot button issues. I think the ecumenical task now is to do the sort of thing you're doing. I mean, I don't think the kind of thing we did in the joint declaration, professors sitting down and trying to reach an agreement which will make fellowship possible, I think of, of a formal variety, recognition of ministries, joint communion. Um, I think the kind of ongoing, the ongoing work of truly knowing the other person's kind of side and learning from it, and when and when you think it's wrong, arguing about it, um, which didn't occur much in the past. I have the sneaking suspicion doesn't occur, it occurs less and less now. Uh, I don't find that many Protestant theologians outside of some evangelicals recently who are interested in engaging Catholic theology and, and my experience in teaching it at a very Catholic institution, the Catholic University of America, is that I have to work to get interest in Protestant theologians. Um, I think we need to continue achieving the kind of fellowship that's possible, even though there are intractable problems. It may not be formal Eucharistic fellowship, but it would be genuine engagement with the other, prayer for the other, um, those kinds of things. So I think we're in a, di slight, a rather different ecumenical period in the future. But of course, I could be wrong. <laughs> As we all could be. But I appreciate you helping contribute to that and coming on to this channel and trying to help me as I work through kind of that more grassroots level of ecumenism, if right. you will. And I, I think I, I tend to agree with you for whatever that's worth, that there was this kind of revolutionary period. But perhaps the drawback is it was mainly at a conceptual level such that the average person in a Lutheran or Catholic pew maybe wasn't affected by this document that is so monumental at the theological level, but for everyday practice issues of politics, of morality, ethics, of ecclesiology, especially as you said, that's a, an authority, that's a big one. Those are what's going to make the biggest difference and are going to be the hardest to do but maybe what we can do right now is begin to understand one another better and kind of lay the groundwork right. for that uh, however we can well dr root thank you again so much this has been a privilege and a joy i end each show uh with these like just one sentence questions as an opportunity to get to get know the guest a little better for the audience especially since it is often at a conceptual level this brings it down right. a bit more uh to the pew level and so first question is uh, what has been the most fruitful habit or spiritual discipline in your life? Some kind of structured daily office, mm -hmm. which I've done as a, I did it early on as a Lutheran and I've done it consistently. I love that. I just got to pray uh, the offices at St. Anselm's Abbey, not too far yeah, from right. you all. Uh, and that was wonderful. All right. Outside the Bible, what has been the most impactful book on your life? When I was 19 or 20, I read Luther's On the Freedom of a Christian still the best book by Luther, uh, and it made an enormous impact on me. Wonderful. Third question, you're having coffee with your undergrad self at Dartmouth, or maybe your early grad school self. What's one piece of advice you give him for his future in theology? Don't think you're going to have a normal academic career because there's no jobs out there. <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I feel that. Uh, this channel is called Gospel Simplicity, and it's often pointed out that the channel can be a bit on the complex side. So I like to wrap up with this question in a sentence or so. What is the gospel? In Christ, God grants us eternal life with himself. Wonderful. Well, Dr. Root, this has been a pleasure, and thanks to everyone who watched this as well. I t don't take your time lightly, and if you enjoyed this, uh, be sure to be on the lookout for more videos, but I'll close as I always do by saying, far more importantly than that, go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world. Mm -hmm.